Hello, my name is Dr Caroline McLaughlin and I'm one of the Palliative Medicine Consultants in the Southern Trust. And today I'd like to talk to you about palliative care management in COVID-19. First of all, this is my disclaimer. We are all learning as we go here. Never has there been a time that we're more challenged, both professionally and personally, but we want to do the very best that we can for our patients. And this guidance and these um, management tips that we're going to talk about today have been based on discussion between myself and all of the other palliative medicine consultants throughout Northern Ireland. Um, we have come together as a group um, and have produced regional guidance which has been badged by the PHA and which should go live later this week um, on the 9th of April 2020. And we really hope that this is guidance that we have developed as a team, but we've also been talking to our, our palliative medicine colleagues in Italy and also to other palliative medicine consultants throughout the UK who are at different points in the COVID trajectory than we are currently in Northern Ireland. So first of all, I'd like to just give you an overview of what I hope to talk about. Um, we'd like to talk about how patients are dying of COVID-19, the potential challenges we face in the community in particular, how we recognise the dying patient, how we look at symptom management in the dying, but also how we look at symptom management in the living, difficult conversations, care after death, and advice and support for us as professionals at this time. So we know when patients who have COVID-19, of those who are diagnosed, 80% have mild to moderate disease, 15% require admission to hospital for severe disease. And one of the questions we have to ask in the community is how will these patients be managed in primary care after the hospitals have reached full capacity? 5% require admission to an intensive care unit and are critically ill. So what do patients die of? Well, the vast majority die of respiratory failure, up to 94%. But we also know that patients are dying from shock, from myocarditis, from cardiac arrhythmias, from high renal failure. That's a picture we've seen more in China and may have been based on medications which they were using, but the picture will become clearer in the UK as we go forward. Secondary or coexisting bacterial infection, there's been mixed reports about that and whether there's been some secondary fungal infection as well. What are the predictors of death on admission for patients if there's bilateral disease? if patients are short of breath on admission, if they have a respiratory rate greater than 24 or oxygen saturations less than 92%. We know hemoptysis is a really bad prognostic feature. We know a white cell count greater than 10 is an adverse prognostic feature, a raised LDL, a low lymphocyte count, or shock or respiratory failure requiring ventilation. This graph looks at mortality rates and compares, compares patients who have COVID-19 with patients with community-acquired pneumonia. Blue is COVID-19 and the red is community-acquired pneumonia. And we can see the mortality rate is so much higher in patients with COVID than in patients with CAP. And we know if we use our CURB 65 guidance for confusion, urea, respiratory rate, systolic blood pressure and age, as the CURB score increases, so does the mortality from COVID-19. So how do we recognise the dying patient? Well, we know once oxygen requirements start to go up, it leads to either mechanical ventilation or death. And it's postulated that there might be two possible trajectories, an ARDS picture, an acute respiratory distress syndrome picture in about 25%, where these patients rapidly decompensate, rapidly deteriorate and become very short of breath. And then patients who deteriorate more gradually, who become more drowsy, who sleep more, who become gradually more short of breath which is probably the picture we're more familiar with looking after with in traditional palliative care. So what's absolutely crucial for all of our patients is that we decide where their ceiling of care is. And to do that, to help us make those decisions, to work on our ethical frameworks, which we already have, to look at autonomy, to look at beneficence, to look at non-maleficence, to look at justice, we need to look at frailty scores. How much support do these patients need for activities of daily living? We have to look at their other comorbidities their underlying prognosis in the pre-COVID period, the likelihood that patient has of survival, and then if we know if a patient has any individual wishes or have any advanced care plans in place. So sometimes it's really good to have a list of questions we ask ourselves when we're trying to make these really difficult decisions. Would this patient benefit from a palliative approach? That's a patient who we think maybe has a really minimal chance of surviving or who's a reasonable chance of not surviving. Are we giving pa patients a chance to survive 
or are we just prolonging the dying process? And we have to think about that if we're sending patients to hospital because we potentially have very symptomatic patients who are socially isolated in rooms where staff are covered in PPE and where they can't have that direct contact from their family. We have to ask, are interventions helping things? If we're giving antibiotics, do we run the risk of giving patients diarrhoea, giving patients C. diff, and not actually improving their overall symptom management? And the question we always ask in palliative care, just because we can do something, doesn't mean we should do something. And we have to ask ourselves, is this what we would want for ourselves if we were in this position, or is this what we would want for our family members? So sometimes it's useful to have a combination of questions in, in combination with our traditional ethical theories to help us to try and make some of these decisions. So who could we from palliative care be looking after in the community? Well, we can't forget the normal palliative care patients, the patients who would have been at home anyway, or potentially the patients who won't be able to get a bed in a hospice or a hospital who are symptomatic. We will have frail patients who are dying of COVID, and we'll possibly have previously well patients who are also dying of COVID. And then there'll be a group of patients who are discharged home from hospital who've been positive for COVID-19, whether those patients are being discharged home to live or discharged home to die. So needless to say, there are huge potential challenges. If we look at the, the projected figures for the number of patients who potentially will be require, requiring care, the number of hospital beds that are available, if GPs, if district nurses, if community nurses are off sick, if carers are not available for whatever reason, if families are having to provide care, families who have no experience, who have minimal support, who are running the risk to their own health and who maybe do not have adequate supplies of PPE. If we don't have enough syringe drivers, if we don't have enough subcut lines, if we don't have enough medications, if patients are just dying too quickly to get their care organised and we know that there are some patients with COVID-19 who deteriorate very quickly and die very quickly. Looking after patients who are really symptomatic and then concerns about whether there'll be enough oxygen available. So huge issues to think about for patients in the community um, at this time. If we think of general principles for palliative care prescribing, what we've seen in England, what we've seen in the rest of the UK, what we've seen in Italy, is that patients who have severe COVID-19 symptoms may require higher or more frequent medication doses than we previously would have been familiar prescribing. So for us as prescribers, for us as clinicians, it means we should have a low threshold to titrate up quickly to achieve good symptom management. And we should also consider supportive treatments for correctable causes. So antibiotic treatment, if we think there's a secondary bacterial infection, and that may actually improve the patient's symptoms. That may improve fever, cough, breathlessness, delirium, things we all know are really distressing for COVID-19 patients. And then also we mustn't forget to optimise treatment of other comorbidities, their COPD, their heart failure, because in turn that may improve their cough and their breathlessness. So the symptom management I'd like to talk about today is the guidance that we have generated as a group of palliative medicine consultants throughout Northern Ireland, our regional palliative medicine physicians group, RPMG, and this has been done in combination with our regional specialist palliative medicine pharmacists, and as I said previously, it has been taken up by the PHA, has been badged by the PHA, and will go live this week on the 9th of April 2020. So firstly, some general principles. We want to try and use oral medicines if possible to preserve the resources of injections and syringe drivers. But if we think time is very short, or if patients are extremely symptomatic, we might want to give them a stat dose first line at the same time as starting a syringe driver, because we mightn't have that much time, we mightn't have a number of days to get to this point. And we know syringe drivers take at least four hours before we start to see any effect on symptoms and can take longer than that. You'll see as I go through the slides, there's some third line medications. These really are only to be used if our first and second choice options are not suitable. We know of as much less well-established practice for third line medicines, and this is what we might have to do if we don't have the right drugs, the right equipment, the right staff. We don't want to get to this point, but we have produced some guidance just in case we do get to this point. And caution should be used in particular with these third line medicines because there is the increased risk of adverse effects. The doses we give are all only a guide. We can only ever give a guide and it is no substitute for using your own clinical judgment for an individual patient. 
If you have a very elderly patient, a very frail patient, a patient who's drug naive, you might want to consider using lower doses. Similarly, if you have a patient who is, you think will have a high drug tolerance or is very symptomatic, you might need to use higher doses and that's where clinical judgment is so important. The drugs we've listed in the regional guidance for the last few days of life for patients with COVID-19 are all compatible in normal saline and we can use up to four drugs in these syringe drivers. As always, the PRN dose will be one sixth of the 24 hour daily dose of the background medication. And of course, if patients are already on background opioids, background benzodiazepines, we would need to adjust those doses accordingly. For COVID-19, we very much want to avoid using fans because of a risk of dispersing virus particles around a room and also mouthwashes, again, because of a risk of dispersing more virus particles. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we manage temperature and how we manage mouth care in the next few slides. The most important message is if you're unsure, ask. Ask us in palliative care. And as we go through this presentation, I'll let you know our contact details. This is how the RPMG, the Regional Palliative Medicine Group's guidance will look on the PHA website. This is the first page. And as you can see, it's been badged by Palliative Care and Partnership and also by the PHA. And it is for use in secondary care as well as primary care. And I have given a very similar presentation to my hospital colleagues as well. So to emphasize this is symptom management for COVID-19 patients who are in the last few hours or days of life. And it's very clear that these are patients who are not for escalation, who are not for ICU, not for ventilatory support, not for intensive hospital treatment. And these are patients in whom we have identified their prognosis, unfortunately, is hours to days. So before we talk about drugs, this is some general guidance that we should consider for all patients. And this is included in the document on the PHA website and that which will be circulated to you. So the first important thing is, as we said before, establish a clear ceiling of care on admission. That's obviously in the hospital environment or if we're thinking about a hospital environment. And make sure that do not attempt resuscitation discussions have taken place. And always remember that even if we have a patient who has a DNA CPR decision, that doesn't mean we don't continue to treat any reversible factors that we can and continue to make sure those patients are as comfortable as possible. There is always something we can do. It's really important that we review the route of administration of medicines for symptom control, continue the oral medicines if tolerated, and to prescribe PRN subcut alternatives if appropriate. If the usual subcut medicines aren't available or cannot be administered, we can look at the third line options and I'll talk about those in more detail shortly. This again is a little bit more for the hospital environment, but if a patient is having regular observations or having BMs, it might be a time to stop those. But there is, for patients who are maybe type 1 diabetics, there is UK-wide diabetes guidance for end-of-life care, and I've included the link in this presentation. So for any patient who's dying, we would always want to make sure we had anticipatory prescribing in place. And I always like to think of the four A's, making sure we have an oral and a subcut analgesic, an oral and a subcut anxiolytic, an oral and a subcut antisecretory agent, and oral and a subcut antiemetic. For regular mouth care, we should consider, as I said before, using regular biotine gel and not using mouthwashes because of the risk of dispersing viral particles. It's really important we rationalise all our medications and consider stopping non-critical medicines if necessary. We should also review the route of other med medication which might be helpful, anti-epileptics, Parkinson's medications. And of course, for any patient, it's really important and as much as we can that we attend to their social, their spiritual and their psychological needs as well, even in these really challenging, really busy times, because that's what patients and that's what families will remember. So this slide lets you see what you will see in the PHA document. I, um, I'll talk about it in more detail shortly, but you'll see there are different colours. Green is first line, our go-to, what we would normally do. Orange or the amber section is second line, either if we have a patient who's got progression of symptoms or if we're looking for an alternative. And then as we go through the presentation, you'll see red, which is our third line, which is our stop and think, and do we have any other options because there is less evidence to support these interventions and potentially more risk of adverse effects. Also, you'll see down the left-hand side, there's an injectable option and there's also a non-injectable option. So we've put dyspnea, we've put shortness of breath, pain and cough, 
all in the same section because the medications we use for those are very similar. So let's look at first line options. Firstly, injectable options. And we divided this up based on the patient's renal function, if that's available. So if you have a patient who's got an EGFR greater than 45, quite a robust patient, um, we would be suggesting morphate sulfate injection, two to five milligrams every two to four hours, PRN subcut. If your EGFR has been impaired between 15 and 45, we would be suggesting oxycodone injection, one to two milligrams every two to four hours, PRN subcut. And the reason for that is that the oxycodone won't accumulate in the same way as morphine would with renal impairment. And then if your EGFR is less than 15 or you're concerned about opioid toxicity, consider using oxycodone injection one milligram and contacting your specialist palliative care team for some advice. For a non-injectable option, if the EGFR is greater than 45, we'd be suggesting morphine sulfate oral solution, or a morph, five milligrams every two to four hours PRN. EGFR 15 to 45, using short tech oral solution, one to two milligrams every two to four hours PRN. And if the EGFR is less than 15, using short tech oral solution, one to two milligrams every two to four hours PRN, and contacting specialist palliative care for advice. It would be useful to prescribe a dosing range if possible, to allow some flexibility in dosing and consider a one to two hour dosing interval in case patients are very symptomatic and we need to up-titrate drugs quite quickly. And then that gives us an opportunity to look at what a patient's needed, needed look at the doses we're using and consider do we need to increase and up-titrate as necessary and as clinically indicated using all of our clinical judgment. So this is now the second line option in the orange or the amber colours for patients who've got progression of symptoms or patients um, in whom we need an alternative. So again, injectable and non-injectable options. So the injectable options, if there's an EGFR of greater than 45, if we know that, if we have that information available. Think about suggesting commencing a syringe driver for a patient maybe who's quite robust, who isn't very frail, who isn't very elderly, who doesn't have a low BMI. Doses we would be thinking about would be morphine sulfate 10 milligrams and midazolam 10 milligrams over 24 hours in the syringe driver. Always ensuring that we're continuing the PRN subcut medication for breakthrough. As you'll see, the doses we're suggesting throughout this are that little bit higher than we would have suggested previously for patients who've been dying from other conditions. And the reason for that is based on the experience that we're getting from the rest of the UK and from Italy, and from the fact that it does appear so patients do seem to need, certain patients do seem to need higher doses. Moving down, if your EGFR is between 15 and 45, consider oxycodone injection five milligrams, plus or minus midazolam 10 milligrams over 24 hours in the syringe driver. Again, making sure you have the PRN subcut injections available. Or if the EGFR is less than 15, or you're concerned about opioid toxicity, consider oxycodone injection one milligram every two to four hours PRN subcut, and consider a medication like alfentanil, if you can get that, if that's available, plus or minus midazolam. And again, we're very happy to be contacted for advice in any of those areas. If you need to consider a non-injectable option, but your patient has progression of symptoms, you might want to consider using whatever available short-acting opioid you have, be it or more for short tech, because constantly we're thinking, could we potentially have supply issues? Could we potentially have administration issues? Using it at an equivalent dose, regularly every four hours and two hourly PRN. You could also consider using a long-acting opioid, such as MST or long tech. And if you wanted some advice on opioid conversion, there is guidance available. Again, the link is in here. But always important to exercise caution if you're prescribing long-acting opioid medication in patients with renal impairment. These links have already been circulated to GPs, but again, I'm very happy to be contacted to supply them again, should that be necessary. So third line, this is your red, your purple box. This is the box that makes you think, stop. Have I used all my other options? Is this the only option I have available? Because this is not what we would routinely advise, but what we feel we should advise in times of COVID because of all the challenges and difficulties we've already discussed. So if you have a patient who's short of breath, who's sore, who has a cough, we could consider patches like Butec and, and fentanyl. And the equivalent doses are up there, a buprenorphine 10 to 20 microgram per hour patch, equivalent to about 20 to 50 milligrams of oral morphine over 24 hours. And similarly, for fentanyl, a 25 of 12 to 25 microgram per hour patch every 72 hours, equivalent to between 30 and 90 of oral morphine over 24 hours. If we wanted to think about using something like Oromorph concentrate or short tech concentrate, as you'll notice, 
it's 20 milligrams for Oromorph concentrate in a mill. So if you want to give 10 milligrams every four hours buccally, you need to give 0.5 mils. So you'd be supplying those patients or their relatives with a one mil syringe. And obviously you can see there's a very high risk of overdose if it's an inaccurate measure. So that's why these are third line options. And for short tech concentrate, it's 10 milligrams in a mil. So you'd be wanting to give five milligrams every four hours via the buccal route. Again, you're using a really low volume, 0.5 mils. You'd be supplying the patient or the family with a one mil syringe. But again, there's a high risk of overdose if inaccurate measures are given, which is why this is third line. Really important to remember that transdermal patches may be absorbed more rapidly in patients who are pyrexic, so there's a greater risk of opioid side effects. Again, this is why this is third line suggestions. And topical opioids take between 24 and 48 hours to establish really an effect. So again, they're not ideal if patients' needs are changing and those patients will require access to short-acting PRN medication. So delirium, we know from talking to our colleagues um, that it may be a direct symptom of COVID-19, but it's also really important that we don't forget there may be another potentially treatable cause of delirium, whether that's a super added infection, whether it's drugs, different drugs, whether it's dehydration, constipation, urinary retention or hypoxia. And it's really important to be able to look for these, these potential causes, identify them and treat them because it's much better to treat an underlying cause than it is to cover it with a medication. So again, we're going to look at the first line, our green box for agitation, anxiety and delirium. So injectable options would be midazolam, two to five milligrams every two hours PRN subcut. And then that's your anxiolytic, but consider adding an antipsychotic, either haloperidol 0.5 to one milligrams PRN or levomipromazine five to 10 milligrams every four hours PRN by injection. If we want to think of a non-injectable alternative for agitation, for anxiety, for delirium, we could think about lorazepam 0.5 to one milligrams every four hours or diazepam, two to five milligrams every four hours PRN. Then as we move on to our orange box, we're thinking this is second line, either because of progression of symptoms or because we want an alternative. So we could think of a syringe drive with midazolam, 10 milligrams over 24 hours subcutaneously, and then adding in either levomipromazine between 10 and 25 milligrams, or haloperidol between three and five milligrams. Levomipromazine tends to be more sedative, so it might be what you choose if that's the effect you're looking for. Haloperidol is what we traditionally use in an acute population with delirium. Then if we want a non-injectable alternative, we could think about haloperidol orally, 0.5 to 1 milligrams, 4 to 6 hourly PRN, or levomipromazine tablets, 6 to 12 milligrams every 4 to 6 hours PRN, maximum three times a day. If it's not possible to get the levomipromazine 6 milligram tablets, we could think about using the 25 milligram tablets, quartering those tablets, dissolving them in water if the patient is able to manage that. Third line, this is your red box, your purple box, your box when you think caution, have I tried everything else because this isn't where the best evidence is, this isn't where our experience has previously been. But for agitation, anxiety, delirium, we could think of buccalam, pre-filled syringes or epistatous buccal solution given five to 10 milligrams every four hours by buccal administration. And if that isn't available, we could think about midazolam solution for injection, which can be administered buccally as well. But as you can see, this isn't normally what we do, so it's not what we're suggesting first or second line. We also could consider diazepam enemas, if it's possible to give medication rectally, olanzapine tablets, risperidone tablets. And if you, we've got to the point where syringe drivers are not available, but you do have a district nurse who is available to administer a subcut injection, consider haloperidol, one to three milligrams subcut daily, or levomipromazine, 10 milligrams subcut, either once a day or twice a day. But again, if you're needing to use these third line options and you want to seek advice, please contact us and we'll, and we'll talk you through them. Respiratory secretions. Again, we're getting familiar with this layout, green first line, injectable and non-injectable. So first line injectable, glycopyronium 200 micrograms every four hours PRN subcut. Or think about a syringe driver of glycopyronium between 600 and 1200 micrograms over 24 hours. Or think about using hyacinth butyl bromide buscopan, 20 milligrams every four hours PRN subcut by injection. 
or considering a boscopan syringe driver of 60 to 120 milligrams over 24 hours subcutaneously. Our non-injectable option would be hyacine hydrobromide sublingual tablets, the Quells tablets, and that's 300 micrograms every six hours PRN. Moving on to our amber, our orange box, if we want to think of second line, alternative or progression of symptoms. Hyacine hydrobromide, 400 micrograms every four hours PRN subcut by injection, or hyacine hydrobromide, 1.2 to 2.4 milligrams, or 1,200 to 2,400 micrograms over 24 hours via syringe driver. We used to use hyacine hydrobromide first line, and we've stopped doing that because we know it crosses the blood-brain barrier and it can cause increased agitation. So that's why it's a second line option here. And then also if we wanted to use a non-injectable option, we could think about using scopoderm patches, which would be a hyacine hydrobromide one milligram patch every 72 hours. But again, because of the risk of side effects of hyacine hydrobromide, we would prefer to use first line glucoperonium or buscopan if possible. For third line for respiratory secretions, it's our red box, our purple box, our stop, think, is this the only option we have? If a syringe driver isn't available, but a district nurse is available and is able to administer subcut injections, consider buscopan hyacine butobromide, 40 milligrams subcut BD, or glycoperonium, 400 micrograms BD or TID. Obviously that is impacts on district nursing capacity, I appreciate that, but this is our third line option if we really have no other other places to go. The other thing we could think about for third line would be atropine, 1% eye drops, which are used sublingually, one to two drops every six to eight hours PRN. And then pyrexia. Again, same layout, green box first line, orange box second line, injectable option, non-injectable option. So obviously the injectable option is more relevant to the hospital population, but if a patient's over 50 kilograms, it will be one gram QID or four to six hourly PRN, or if a patient's less than 50, 50 kilograms, it will be 15 milligrams per kilogram, QDS, or four to six hourly PRN. Non-injectable alternative, paracetamol oral tablets, one gram, QDS, or four to six hourly PRN. And if we want to consider non-medication options, cooling the face using a cool cloth, using oral fluids, but avoiding fans because of the risk of dispersing virus particles around the room. Second line alternatives, um, or if it's progression of symptoms, we know that non-steroidals are not currently recommended for COVID-19. And until we have more safety data, that is the, the official advice, but they may be an option if you have a patient at the end of life where you feel their prognosis is very short, maybe hours, and it's really difficult to control their pyrexia and you have no other alternatives. If that was the case, you could consider using paracoxib, Dynastat, and it could either be 20 milligrams BD, PRN, subcut, or you could think about putting it in a syringe driver between 40 and 80 milligrams over 24 hours. Paracoxib is the only drug which doesn't mix with any other drugs, so if you're using a paracoxib or a dynastat syringe driver, there can be no other medication in there because those drugs will not be compatible. If you want a non-injectable alternative, paracetamol suppositories, if it's possible, or diclofenac suppositories. But again, with the proviso that non-steroidals are not currently recommended for COVID-19, but may be worth considering if we have a patient who's very end stage in the last few hours of life and we're trying to balance benefit and risk. So that's really taken us through all the drug options. I've included in this presentation a little bit about communication and I completely accept that you all do this really well already. But I've just put a little bit in here because we're in such challenging times and sometimes if there's even a few, a few points that can, can trigger in our memory, um, it might make a real difference for our patients and their families. So tips for communicating with conscious patients. For things we'd recommend, addressing patients and giving them our name, not I'm the doctor on duty, just to personalise things and, and explain that we're doing the very best we can for the patients. And this may seem really obvious, but we have to think that the patient may be wearing a mask, we may be wearing full PPE, so so many barriers to our humanity, so many barriers to connect with just one person in a room with another person have been taken away from us from COVID-19. So we really have to be really aware of the words we use, the body language we use, the tone of voice we use to try and bring patients and their families some reassurance at such a dreadful time. It's really important to acknowledge where patients are at. I understand that this is an emotional time. 
it's really understandable that you're frightened, that you're scared. And we're doing all our very best for you to make sure you don't, comf you don't suffer, to keep you as comfortable as possible. And it's important to avoid saying things like there's nothing more we can do because there are always things we can do. We may not be able to cure a condition, but we can do our very best to alleviate the symptoms, to give people as much dignity and comfort as we possibly can. Important to say that you must be, not to say that you must be strong or brave for your family, or if it don't worry, you'll die quietly and peacefully with these drugs. Obviously try to avoid all of those things. This is a slide on advanced care planning, and I don't know about you, but often when we think of advanced care planning, we think of complicated booklets and lots of work, and that, that's not what this slide is about, and that's not the time that we're in at the moment. This slide is about having a conversation with a person in front of us, as two people in a room trying to find a way through and trying to find out what matters most to the person. And it's important to acknowledge that I know it must be very scary at the moment. With all the news updates, you must be feeling really vulnerable. This is really hard stuff to talk about, but we'd like to clarify a couple of things if we could and know what your worries are for the future. We hope for the best for you, but unfortunately we have to plan for the worst. And we're so sorry about that. We wish we weren't in this situation, but we worry that if you get sicker with COVID-19 and all of your other health problems, you wouldn't survive an ICU admission. And I wonder if we can take this chance to see if you or if your family are prepared for that. And we're so sorry. We should think about what treatments that you wouldn't want and also the treatments that we wouldn't be able to do. And that leads us on to talking to patients about resuscitation and explaining that it, unfortunately it's really unlikely to be successful if it's a patient at the very end of life and there's no treatment to cure the underlying condition. And it's really important to ask patients what matters most because often that's what can, can make a rambling consultation become really focused if we just find out from the patient what it is they really want. And again, because so much of our communication is going to be blocked by our masks, by our aprons, by our gloves, potentially by our visors, by all of our equipment, all of our kit, it's really important that we use phrases like, I think, sadly, unfortunately, I'm so sorry, to try and overcome these barriers that, that have been put in place to communication by COVID-19. Because that's what patients will remember, and that's what families will remember, how we spoke to them. So now some tips for communicating with a family of an unconscious patient. And sometimes these conversations will be on the phone because of, of what we're dealing with with COVID-19 at the moment. So again, it's really important to introduce ourselves with our full name and our role, not just I'm the doctor on duty. And I apologise, I'm so sorry for due to this awful situation we can't meet in person to talk about your relative. To try and give the information really slowly and gradually and pause to allow the person on the other side of the phone to process what we've said, to hear what we've said, so that we're in a position to go forward. To name what we're hearing, to say we can hear or we understand that you're frightened, that you're scared, that you're feeling desperate. We hear that, we see that, if possible. Provide information really gradually. We have done everything in our power for your relative at this really difficult time, but unfortunately, I'm really sorry to say our medicine has reached its limits and their condition is deteriorating. We are so very sorry. And at the moment we are doing our very best to keep your relative as comfortable as possible and as peaceful as possible. So that's really tough stuff, it's really hard stuff to talk about, but it's what patients will remember. And it's, it's what we mustn't lose sight of in the midst of this pandemic. We mustn't lose sight of our humanity as doctors, as healthcare professionals. And we must make sure our patients and our families can see that. After death care. Some of this is more relevant to the hospital environment. Some will be relevant to community. If we have to verify the death of a patient, we need to wear the appropriate PPE and maintain all our infection control measures. We know to certify a death that COVID-19 is an acceptable cause of death and it's not a reason on its own to refer that death to the coroner. The death certificate is now online only in the hospital environment and must be emailed. For cremation, we now know there's no requirement for the second signature, which used to be the case in pre-COVID times, to avoid exposing another doctor to an infected body and using PPE. 
and the cremation form is placed in a wipeable pocket which goes with the body. And we also know that unfortunately patients who have implantable devices in situ can't be cremated because they're not being removed and it's really important that patients or their families are aware of that. Unfortunately cremations are clo crem crematoriums are closed to visitors and the Department of Health are recommending no viewing to funeral directors. Body bags are being re recommended by the Department of Health. For patients, and particularly hospital patients, any jewellery um, that the family want to take must be placed in a sealed plastic bag and not open for seven days. And any personal clothing or blankets ideally should be disposed of, but if not, placed in a washable bag that the family are given warning about the risk of transmission of virus particles and that it's washed at a high temperature, 60 degrees or higher. I have to say that having been a palliative medicine consultant for 10 years and giving lots of presentations over that time, I've never had to talk about body bags and I think it really brings it home as to what difficult times that we're in. This is a document Graving in Exceptional Times which has been produced by the Irish Hospice Foundation and is going to be part of a bereavement pack which is sent home from hospitals when a patient dies from COVID-19 in the hospital environment. There's some really good stuff in here and I understand from having spoken to my colleagues um, in bereavement and the trust that there's going to be a document produced in the next few weeks, few days, few weeks, which incorporates Northern Ireland as well. But it's a really good guide and you can find it on the Irish Hospice Foundation website www.bereaved.ie And these are some of the documents that you'll probably be familiar with already and we've sent out um, links to, to you all already. There's the Palliative Adult Network Guidelines, the PAN Guidelines, and they're available in an electronic format as well as a hard copy. There's the Your Life and Your Choices Plan Ahead booklet. There's the Management of Pain and Shortness of Breath in Adults with Severe Renal Impairment in EGFR Less Than 30 the opioid conversion chart, our traditional RPMG guidance for the management of symptoms in the last day of life, which was produced a number of years ago, is regularly updated, but was produced before our new COVID-19 guidance, but it's still there and it still may be a useful guide because not all patients will be dying from COVID-19. And then some advice about bereavement. So as we come towards the end of this presentation, I think it's really important that we also think about ourselves a little bit and think about self-care for us, because this is unprecedented times for us all. And this was something one of the nurses in hospice said not so long ago. Every day may not be a good day, but there is something good in every day. And that's maybe something we can hang on to. And it's really important to know that how we feel as a clinician is what we bring to the bedside. So if we're tired, if we're distressed, if we're angry, if we're exhausted, if we've had enough, we transmit that, maybe not verbally, but we transmit that through our body language. So it's really important for us and for our own mental health that we look at that, but it's also really important for our patients and their families so that we don't transmit those emotions across. These are some websites, Unimind, Mind, Headspace, BigHealth.com, where there's guidance as to different techniques that might be helpful. Really the important thing is that you find what works for you and you use it because never have we needed to use these techniques more and use the support mechanisms that we have in place more. I like this, I found this on another presentation, the Joy at Home, the post-shift checklist for the road home. So when you're coming home to your family, review, take a moment to think about the day you've had. Reflect on your day, think about two things that were really difficult and be compassionate to yourself. Allow that, Allow, forgive yourself for that. Then reassess and think about three things that went well. And I'm sure you will find three things that you've gone well every day, even in our worst days. And take pride in the presence of those three things in that day. Try and restore and connect the value that you bring to your work and see the value that you bring every day. And then come home and rest and switch your attention to home, making sure you have your shower when you get home first. So this is coming to the end of the presentation. Um, it's a presentation I've never given before. Um, it's guidance that we have generated over a very short period of time. I assure you that as our experience grows, if we feel our guidance needs to be adjusted and updated, we will do that and we will do that through the PHA website and we'll keep you in contact with you as much as we possibly can. And I think we're all a bit scared, but maybe if we're all in this together, then it's a little bit better and our fear levels are slightly lower. 
I'm going to finish with a slide that gives you some contact details. We have a dedicated telephone line for community palliative care nurse specialist advice. It's 9am to 10pm seven days a week and the number's here. And also in the out of hours of the bank holiday period, we have doctor to doctor advice available via the Southern Area Hospice in Newry. I've also included my email address in the Southern Trust here if there are any queries to come forward. Thank you. And I take care and stay safe.